Good morning. Um, I suppose the one thing about this panel is this one is very much gender independent in topic wise because we're talking about technology and technology doesn't really have a gender per se I suppose but a um, little bit of audience participation just to start with and then I'll introduce the topic groups who has and I'm sure almost who has a smartphone All right okay I want you to close your eyes for about 10 seconds and imagine that the only thing you could do on your smartphone is make a telephone call, send an SMS message, or play a very simple game called Snake. <laughs> right? Now I know a lot of you would be breaking out in a sweat at the moment at the thought of that because you know you wouldn't be able to use Facebook or Instagram or anything like that. But the reality is in the year 2000, that was our world as far as the technology of smartphones was concerned. I remember when I first started my master's in IT, there was a topic that we did called uh, future technology and social impact. And I remember quite vividly watching a series of um, concept videos of this thing that they, I don't even think it had the name smartphone at the time, but they showed what would life be like if we had a mobile connected device which had computing power and all those sort of things and 16 17 years on all of that and more has become a reality to all of us and or many many people in the world have two or three of these devices let alone just one so back in the year 2000 if we were having this discussion maybe the smartphone would be what is the next big thing in technology so Hopefully in today's session, I would like these um, highly experienced people that I have the honour of um, leading this morning um, to uh, help us decide or give us some information about what maybe three, four, five new technologies that are going to change the world in the next five or so years. And we can keep an eye out on them just for interest's sake or maybe even might spark an idea of some sort of new entrepreneurial venture for you today. So the other thing, as I was researching this group, I discovered that collectively our panel members have over 80, that's eight zero, years of experience. <laughs> um, yes, I think that is actually worthy of, <laughs> worthy of applause, either creating new technology or using new technology to create a business. So, in alphabetical order, because I found no other sensible way to sort of do them without sort of showing some favouritism, um, we have, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce your last name. It's phonetic, you can do it. Oh, can I? Oh, okay. Bhattacharya? Perfect. Oh, very good. Dr. Badushi Bhattacharya. I was a little bit reticent at this because when I heard about your background, I thought, oh, awesome, she's a rocket scientist. And I thought, oh, I better not say that. She might, not she might feel a bit offended. And then I read your bio and you officially classify yourself as a rocket scientist. So, um, and as a guy that sort of loves space stuff, that's pretty awesome as far as I'm concerned. So she's a rocket scientist and entrepreneur. Um, most of the very popular space missions from NASA that you've heard of uh, Badushi's had a finger somewhere involved in parts of, the, parts of those missions. Um, and she currently has, uh, is the CEO and founder of the Aust Austropreneurs Hub, uh, which is Asia's first space technology incubator, and the CEO and founder of the Bhattacharya Space Enterprises, which is an organisation which helps uh, educate and train people in space, space science and related technologies. Uh, we have Beverly Delore, she's a computer scientist um, with experience in software engineering and uh, management roles around software engineering. She's the head of technology at SpaceMob, which is a co-working space, which you might think, what technology is involved there? But the whole thing that makes SpaceMob different is that they deeply embed aspects of technology in how the members of the co-working space can work and interact with the space itself. And then we have, I was going, I had here doctor, but I just suddenly found out it's soon to be doctor, soon to be doctor, <laughs> doctor Ayushikana, um, 
who seems to have packed an amazing amount of things in a ridiculously short career. Um, <laughs> she's um, an author, consultant, advisor, editor, and entrepreneur. I th have I missed anything? No, <laughs> totally unfocused. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she started her career in the financial services industry, advising very large financial service companies on how to um, automate uh, many aspects of the financial trading processes and she advises governments and companies uh, on issues around um, technology and social and, uh, social and economic impact. And she's currently the CEO and founder of Ado, which is an artificial intelligence advisory firm and incubator. And she also founded 21C Girls in Singapore. And I like the story about how that happened as well. Um, and we finally we have uh, Natalie Ting, um, she's a software engineer and entrepreneur. Uh, she briefly worked in the telecommunications industry <laughs> and then um, went straight off into um, a little startup at the time but um, suddenly had a very big impact, a company called Moby Pocket. And they were one of the founding companies in the e-reader uh, technologies uh, back in the early 2000s. And then um, a little online retailer you may have heard of called Amazon decided that their technology was pretty darn cool and bought it. And um, then she moved off into, because entrepreneurism seems to be her thing, moved into a couple of other companies and she's now with um, Upvise, which is a uh, cloud-based uh, software as a service application um, for businesses. So. What I thought we'd start off with, we'd start with the present. So what do you think is, what technology or technologies do you think is having the greatest impact on society today? Um, Beverly, or whoever wants to start? Yeah, I think, um, I mean right now, because we're in the co-working space, so I think um, um, definitely anything that, that interacts with the space, the physical space. So, this is like IoT stuff, right? Um, uh, I think um, these are the things that we can definitely use in my, in my current industry right now, where we, we, we can incorporate like um, devices that monitors the usage of the space, um, probably even temperature, or even the smell of the whole office. So uh, for me, that's something that's very right now. IoT and also artificial intelligence, because IoTs are, are uh, just the eyes and the ears, they said, of technology that gathers this information and data. So you need something to analyze all this data and make it more intelligent, which is the artificial intelligence. So all this data will just be very much um, um, analyzed by, by this artificial intelligence programs or applications out there. Yeah, I would say that at the present, we think that there are two main things. One is the mobile phone, despite uh, people thinking it's kind of a last century tool is actually much more powerful now and is responsible for a lot of the data that we're getting and a lot of the way we connect to emerging market consumers. And apart from that, the other thing is then data um, and naturally leading into artificial intelligence. How are you collecting data and what are you doing with it? Um, I've been just consistently impressed with some of the innovations that I'm seeing from healthcare to agriculture to transportation. And I think there's enormous amounts of potential there. And it's every time you think it's the future, you realize that it sees already right now. So in that sense, um, you know, we are talking near future, present to near future, even in this uh, panel, I think, to a degree. Thanks. Well, um, I think um, I'd like to say that, it, that it's first internet and then, then mobile. And to put everything into in a more historical perspective, I know everybody here in, uh, has a phone and you can't, as you were saying, uh, imagine that before this you had phones just to call people. So uh, first internet, um, that happened... The very first network, um, networks connecting people around the world was around in the 1960s, ARPANET, the US military, it already existed, so that was uh, 60, 60, 50, 1960s. yeah, 1960s. Um, just to show you that things take time and technology um, 
quite often the technologies exist, the, the physics, the science are already there, but it takes a maturing of the whole uh, environment um, in terms of for the internet to become what we use every day and to change our lives. Um, it took, um, so 1995 is uh, Amazon. Uh, if anyone, I don't know if anybody can re remember that, but Amazon is now um, just above 20 years old. Um, before, before that, we uh, in our generation lived with uh, no email. Um, your, your personal computer was, uh, you know, in the 1980s, you had your first big PC. Uh, so obviously no laptops. So it all happened really very fast over the past 20 years. Um, so in internet, it is the major, I think, uh, technology that has had an impact on our whole society. Um, if you take a really, you know, more bit of uh, background on this, um, it has changed our lives so much uh, because it makes us a, a global world. Um, before internet, uh, people had to, you know, call each other. You, you didn't have access to any information easily. Uh, right today, you just, you know, you don't know something, you just type on Google and you find the information straight away. And it's useful in, in so many areas, um, well, it's especially in coding uh, software when you're looking up a, a problem. Uh, there's always someone and somewhere in the world who's had exactly that same very specific technical problem. So you find the answer instantly. Way back when you had your problem, you were, you know, in your little office, you know, trying to uh, figure out how to fix uh, that bug. You'd maybe take, you know, a few weeks because you had to figure out either on your own or try to discuss with someone. So it's changed our lives because it makes people, companies um, go so much faster with all the information that we have at our fingertips. Um, and it's changed our lives because we can communicate um, all over the world with anyone, uh, someone in France, someone in Singapore, someone you can work on different continents. Um, and you can also have these kind of, um, um, you don't have to work in a traditional way anymore in a, in a company, like you all go to the same place and you all uh, just uh, work together there. You can actually have um, more agile kind of companies where you'll have, uh, and that's what we do in, in our in Upvise right now. We're based in Singapore, but we work um, with Australia, we work with uh, Europe, uh, France, we work with people in the US, and it's, it's completely changed the way companies work. So internet, I think, is really the first major technology that has an impact today. And after internet came, of course, the mobile. Um, and that's not that long ago, too, because when we started Upvise uh, 10 years ago, um, there was no iPhone. So we started the, our company. There was uh, those Nokia, Nokia phones. I don't know if anybody <laughs> knows the brand anymore. It's, it was the major, Nokia was the major uh, phone manufacturer of, uh, from Finland and they were number one and nobody, no one had anything else than the Nokia. But you could only just call, you could type your, it was called T1, you know, you had a predictive text and but people would make a really good job of that actually you could uh, type your like today you use a uh, whatsapp or whatever so but you would type your all your messages just with nine um the, the nine keys and you'll make up all your words like that so that was only maybe 10 years ago so it's happened so fast and it's had such a huge impact uh, on uh, what we do and even 10 years ago you would be using facebook maybe just on your computer, uh, because it was not on mobile yet. Um, now, you know, everyone uses your mobile for everything. Um, I think it's just to put it in perspective, um, it's, it's all happened very fast in the past 20 years. Um, but the major impacts are from internet and the mobile internet. 
So um, thanks, everybody, for coming out, for giving us your Saturday morning, um, your whole day Saturday, actually. The program here looks really great, and I wish I could stay and attend some of the sessions myself this afternoon, but we're doing another training workshop. So in terms of what I think has been the most major change in the past, um, I'll just even go back more than a few decades, just you know, in the past few centuries for all of humanity, is our access to information. So that has done so much, not just on a technical level, but on a social level, on a psychological level, to put us in a whole different mindset. If you think about your average 10-year-old today and how much they know, and you compare that to a scholar from the Middle Ages, somebody from a renowned university, that 10-year-old kid has access to and knows more stuff than the scholar would have back in the Middle Ages. You know, we talk about pop culture, the kids, up, anywhere you go on vacation, you hear the same exact songs in the restaurants, right? We all have access to the same information, the same cultural norms, and I think that's really what's revolutionized things, and we're at a really exciting point right now in terms of human civilization, because we're just to the point where everybody globally is coming online. You know, we've got, and I have to bring in space, we've got satellites that are providing internet across the planet to rural areas of Africa, to all over Asia, South America. And that is gonna be a game changer, so um, anybody in this room who's under the age of 40, I think 20 years from now, for you guys, you'll be working in a very different world. Those of us who are a little older will still be working, but I think what you will see and the world that you will be part of is going to be very different because of the, just the incredible amount of information that you just have right there in your phone. So um, it's a really real game changer and I'm pretty excited about the future. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think the... Um Natalie's point about the internet, like just creating that foundation of connectivity that everything else um, is based on. And I've read a bit about history of science and you look at the history of science and certain things, there's always a, a technology had to be developed before a scientist could then discover something new which led to a new technology being developed which led to another scientist discovering something new. So I suppose on that point, what do you think are uh, sort of those, you know, expanding on, say, uh, the internet and things like that? What are, the, what, are the, what are those foundational technologies that uh, we either are just emerging now or we, you know, that you've heard of that are, you know, coming around the corner that will be the basis for that whatever the next big thing that we're going to tell everyone is so they'll make a million dollars at the end of the, at the, end of the thing? So what's happening? Okay, in my opinion, I may be biased. I think artificial intelligence is now going to become a commodity and utility. Um, because so much data is being generated, it has to be processed. And um, right now, you need a lot of experts to process it. So I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the platforms that we're building is a micro-insurance platform for Asian farmers. So Asian farmers are very vulnerable. They live on $1 to $4 a day. And in the Philippines, for instance, there are 20 to 25 typhoons a year. But nobody will give them credit and nobody will give them insurance because it's very hard to estimate the destruction. Even the largest microfinance bank has to go and send hundreds of people there to manually check uh, how much crop was destroyed. But we are using satellite imagery. So we are using hyperspectral imaging, microwave imaging, thermal imaging to understand and do early loss detection. But for us at the moment, that means subscribing to very expensive satellite imagery. But then also we have five experts in our team who are computer vision experts and then SAR experts and, and um, other kinds of satellite image processing experts. I think. What we'll see now is that as more people make cloud-based platforms, we'll see kind of a commodification of this. And then I'll have to find a new business model, but uh, it's all for the good, right? We're all kind of running ahead and the technology is automating everything. So one of the things is that we are constantly in a disruptive mode. Um, I think maybe space is the only thing where you have a lot of time still because it's still early days maybe kind of. But for somebody like me who's been in tech my entire life, I am I'm making the very machines that I have to stay ahead of. So I think that's a kind of a mindset thing, but also it's a, the commodification of everything that you build. And to be okay with that and not to be married to anything that you build as something that can't be disrupted, I think is really important. 
Yeah, so um, I think for, for my case, I think your question is more like what should be in place first before this advent of things happen. I think always uh, the reservations for companies or even governments is cost. Like transitioning from an old platform to the new platform can cost a lot. And, and given that, I think having more, uh, sorry, more players, more providers of such um, services would lower the cost. And that's a good thing. Because technology will allow us to do that. I mean, if more people, um, so for example, IoT devices, if more people are developing these devices, then governments or companies can have a way to do this, uh, like, like roll it out easily. And cloud, she mentioned about cloud. So everything right now, you don't have to build it by yourself. There are like cloud services, service, services that you can just um, subscribe to and then you can just use it in your company and that be basically um, lower the lower the cost of maintenance lower the cost of training people and I think that's the that's the first thing I think um, having more players having more people creating the basics of technology so that we can advance more and help people more to advance in that in that in that area that they wanted to pursue is what we need to have Um, so, uh, so in my area, when um, mobile clouds has really passed, you know, technology now. Uh, no, I think um, VR, uh, virtual reality, is is really promising. Uh, it's been a lot of progress over the past two, three years. Um, the first VR headsets, uh, well, you had, you know, were quite expensive and. Uh, and then Mark Zuckerberg came in, Facebook um, bought up uh, Oculus and, and Samsung now. You can, you can actually buy um, relatively inexpensively now. You can get a um, Samsung Gear uh, VR headset, put in your smartphone so you don't have to buy both. You, know, you use your smartphone as the engine for the VR headset. And um, more and more you're seeing um, uh, interesting uh, usages of uh, VR. So the first, of course, is in entertainment, games, uh, all the 3D experience, movies that are in 3D. Um, and my kids love it because we bought the first version, the second version of the Samsung Gear headset. And uh, you can see your... Uh, so that was two years ago we bought the first version. You could just see the sample uh, media. Uh, nice movies, you're on a helicopter and then suddenly you have uh, uh, someone all coming up above you. So it's really exciting, all those things. But those were just samples and now, now I just looked into it again uh, and in the new version you can actually you have so many apps that came up. Um, you can you know, film your own uh, 3D um, movies and, and view them in, in your headset. Um, and it's, you can even uh, go to Toys R Us, and you buy a um, Google Cardboard uh, VR headset. It goes for like $30, $35, and it, it's a VR headset, so you, you can view your, um, all your 3D pictures or videos. You can s install a whole set of uh, there's hundreds of apps nowadays, and applications um, will have um, an impact, I was saying, obviously video games and movies, but also you can imagine in professional areas like well, in, my, in construction, like what we do in, in Upvise, you could imagine that um, the, the guy who's on the, on the field needs to um, maybe follow a procedure, a safety procedure, quality uh, process, instead of uh, just looking it up on his phone and uh, using a rather small screen and clumsy uh, interface, you could have your headset and view the complete uh, procedure in a much more comfortable way. Uh, you could imagine um, also um, if you want to visit, because we, we have a s an application in our suite which is um, defect tracking in, uh, in um, apartments, uh, con new condo units when you want to uh, you want to track all the d different uh, defects that y you know. You just take a picture and then you uh, you send it back to your to the to the owner to say, oh, this this uh, apartment has a, that, that there's a problem here. But you could imagine um, 
viewing your virtually viewing um, visiting an apartment, visiting uh, any um, place, and then filming your own um, your own uh, in, to report on what you see. You could use uh, you could film your own 3D movie and then uh, send it back for reporting. So I mean, I, s I think there's a lot of potential in in 3D and, and VR and obviously um, a lot of the major players um, are, are into it right now so um, I, th I think we're going to see a lot coming up there. Okay, so this is where I get to talk about space. <laughs> I get very excited when anybody asks me about space or my kids, so <laughs> great to be here. Let me ask you guys a question, and um, I'll just tell you ahead of time, the number of people that say yes to this over the past three years in Singapore has gone up in a way that's really been impressive. How many people here have thought about being an astronaut either now or in your childhood, or have considered space as a potential career path? Wow, that's awesome. So it used to be I would get maybe one or two people raising their hands. I don't know if they were embarrassed or if it was really just not the case that they saw space as a fe feasible thing for the future. But for, um, for those of you who raised your hands and for everybody else, um, what I really want to convey is space technology is real, it's happening, and it's global. And we have a really great opportunity for Singapore to get involved at this point. Um, so space tourism, you, this group probably knows Elon Musk and SpaceX, I don't have to explain who he is. Um, you know, Elon is sending people to the moon to fly around the moon in 2018. He's talking about putting people on Mars by say 2030, 2035. Even if he doesn't get there by 2030 or 35, the number of innovations he's going to need are going to have to come from you guys. People are going to have to come up with sensors, software, psychological tools, um, sociological methods to manage people traveling in space for so long. And all of this has to happen very soon um, because if we want to meet our goals, we have to have the tech in place. And my hope is that everybody here gets themselves you know, into a position where they have tech that can be acquired and built upon by people like Elon Musk and uh, Richard Branson and all the others. Um, so I would say space tourism is happening and it's going to be a thing in I'd say the next five years. And the other thing I want to talk about is um, asteroid mining. I don't know how much you guys know about asteroids, but they're from the early solar system. So the minerals that are in asteroids are very easy to mine. They're not geologically processed like on Earth. They have to grind stuff up. Yeah, so yeah, that's right. It's, it's very pure in space. And if you, we know what the rocks are made of because we have telescopes. We can take measurements and do spectroscopy. If you spend, uh, let's just say, $10 million getting up there and you're able to build, bring back a billion dollars with a B, with the material, you're going to come out doing very well. And all of this is possible because we have the miniaturization of electronics. You talk about your cell phone you know, being the size of a computer from 40 years ago. We have satellites you can hold in your hand that weigh 1.3 kg that are up there taking images of the kind that Aisha was talking about. This is happening right now, and I really, really do hope that you guys take space seriously as a career. And if you want to talk to me about this afterwards, I'll just go on and on. I better stop. <laughs> I would definitely add that this is an incredible area for young people to get involved in. Um, you know, being in artificial intelligence, I'm often asked the question about automation and the loss of jobs. With this space and space tourism, asteroid mining, this all represents a whole new area of jobs for us as the traditional jobs are getting automated. So my kids are coming to you. <laughs> Can I ask you a question too? My daughter is 13, she wants to be an astrophysicist, so what can you do for her? Yay. Um, we, we have a number of workshops that we run. We have one at the Art Science Museum on the 8th of July that we're running on CubeSats, and if she knows a little bit of programming, um, then that might be a really good opportunity for her. And I'm happy to talk to anybody who wants to know about being an astrophysicist. And in this particular context, if you want to know what it's like to be a female, the only pregnant female in a room of 20 men, then I can, <laughs> I can share lots of stories with you guys. Well, um, I've been given the sign, which is winded up now. So I'm going to ask, the, this is put your money, the, put, the hypothetically put your money where your mouth is question. So. Um, I know Natalie will have the direct experience of this, but just, you know, Jeff Bezos just, you know, asked Alexa to buy Whole Foods for him or something, something like that. Um, so let's just hypothetically say Jeff Bezos has decided to buy out your particular current ventures and you've all been given a 
billion dollar payout. So you've had a big holiday because you've worked very hard, you know, and now and you can't let go of the entrepreneurial spirit. Where, which new emerging technology do you invest your money in? I, I can yeah. start. Um, so, okay, so we are doing space education, space training at this point, um, and we're also trying to bring together the ecosystem, not just in Singapore, but in um, Asia in general. So I would take that billion, after I'd spent some on the vacation, and um, I would really go into funding our incubator because we have so many ideas that come to us. I mean, in, even in Singapore, what, we're 5.5 million people here. You can't believe the number of people who send us emails saying, I have an idea for space tech. So if we could just fund that, um, I think we'd just go amazing places. So. That was where I'd put it. Uh, well, I, I'd put it in uh, AI uh, because I think <laughs> that's, that's really the area where we have not really reached the full potential yet. So, and there's so much to do. Yeah, I, mean, I, you know, I get this question a lot. What would you do if you had a billion dollars? And I'm like, I'd still do this exact same thing. Uh, and I think all of us would because we love what we do. And artificial intelligence, we're just starting now. But AI for impact, and I think that we do a lot of stuff for people. We do it around smart cities and sustainable transportation. Um, and you know, as a company that has a luxury, as we grow bigger, to choose the kind of products we do. We do more in healthcare. We do more for the, the poor farmers of the world. And I think really bringing up the bottom billion and really making a difference to their quality of life through artificial intelligence um, and democratizing access to those services and infrastructure is a dream of mine. Whether I get those billion or not, we're doing it. Um, first, I'll buy an island. Islands, <laughs> basically. But um, I think two things. Um, I really believe in IoT. I think the um, World Economic Forum in their white paper on the fourth industry um, revolution is that right now we have 18 billion devices of IoT devices around. In 2025, they are projecting it to be around 80 billion. So that's how big this industry is going to be. And, and for me, that's a very steady, steady growth Actually, it's exponential growth from 18, 18 billion right now. So I think that's a very good um, technology to focus on. Because one, I think as an engineer, I'm still coding like 80% of my day every day. <laughs> um, I think for me, I, I, it's more of why I went into this field is I want to help solve problems. And I think IoT can, can do that for even at homes, right? Like in your, refriger your fridges, you don't buy fridges every one year. Usually it's 10 years, 5 years. But having these devices, like the Amazon Dash buttons, can add, can add intelligence to your old fridges or can add intelligence to your old washing machines. And that's good. That's something that I'm very excited about, that it's going to be a, way, a long way to go in that. The other thing is um, advanced um, automation. I think the, the question of robots and humans shouldn't be a question at all. It could be a collaboration of human-robot collaboration. So um, right now, they're, they're um, doing or inventing machineries that help people to be stronger, like people operating these machines to be strong, to lift up heavy things. And, and I'd like to see that, because right now, here in Singapore, if you go McDonald's, <laughs> you go that all these kiosks has been replaced, uh, all the cashiers have been replaced by this kiosk. And it doesn't have to be like that. It, it can be a collaboration between humans and robots. So I think that, for me, is a very exciting field that I'm happy that people are looking into that kind of collaboration. So yeah, so I'm just excited about it. Um, oh, I'd just like to add one last thing, which is that um, in AI and anything that deals with information, you have to be very careful about cybersecurity. So even though none of us are in that field, um, that is critical. And then the other one for AI especially is, um, is beneficial AI, making sure that we are in control of the algorithms. So ethical ethics. Okay, so thank you very much. So I will now, if you've got your list handy, so we've got artificial intelligence, uh, robots and internet of things, um, augmented reality, virtual reality, and space technology are the things that we should be looking out for in the next five years. So thank you very much to my panel members. It's been an thank honor. And thank you to Eva you. for organizing this group of people for me to chair.
um, Dr. Bedushi, if you don't mind helping us with the lucky draw. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Bedushi, um, Aisha, Natalie, Beverly, and Steve for sending us through this conversation about what's next in technology and um, how we can leverage it and create innovative spaces in our startups and innovative ideas on how we can make a change in the world. Um, I only wonder in 20 years if we have the same event, what would we be talking about on the panel then?